So I'm here with uh, Dr. Jonathan Michaels from, uh, oh, of course, I left the note of uh, where you're from, the Neural Prosthetics Systems Laboratory Correct. in uh, Stanford. And what was the name of that group? Shinoi Group. Correct, Shinoi Lab. I got it. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I wanted to talk to you about um, representations of, of things in the brain and about motor generation and that sort of thing, because you, you have a specialty in, in uh, motor, the motor cortex. So we'll get into that, but first, what is it about the motor system that tweaked your interest? Um, so everything that, that we do, that we can do, and the only way that we can, can observe that we interact with the world in any way is through motion. Right? Mm -hmm. The only way that we can observe also in any animal, really directly, um, how they interact with the world is through, mo is through motion. Right. So um, some people might go really far and say, uh, you know, pretty much everything that's going on in the brain only makes sense in light of motion. Uh, certainly, you know, in light of behavior, and that, that's a, that's a phrase that could be used all the time. That yeah, uh, everything has to be understood with respect to behavior, the end, the end output of the system. Yeah. Um, so somehow, studying the motor system is like studying the whole brain. Yeah, behavior affects the world, the state of the world, and it affects you, and you have to figure out how that behavior does that. <laughs> I got your topics here in the giant envelope, uh, so let's let's go through the topics, and then we'll probably take these one by one because I think there's a good flow here. So we'll talk about grasping uh, monkeys, uh, reading the brain, and then to uh, neural neuron population. Neuron population. Yeah. Um, and then finally, strange attractors. We'll talk a little bit about dynamical systems. Uh, but I'd like to talk first about the grasping monkeys, and, and maybe you can get some context to this, because you've done a lot of work with monkeys and grasping yeah. over your career. So maybe you could just talk about, let's say I'm a monkey and I'm about to grasp something. I see something and I'm going to grasp it. Mm. What happens in your brain? What are the sort of the stages of planning and execution? And what's going on in your neurons when you try and, and you need to grasp something? So I'm going to preface this with, we don't. No, very well. Uh, which is, I get this preface a lot. <laughs> yeah, I think it's I think it's always important to, to that you know. Uh, so obviously, without you know minimizing the visual system too much, there's a lot that goes on just just in seeing the scenario in front of you, sure. seeing the objects in front of you, um, just being able to to process where the objects are, uh, or what they are, whether they mm. correspond to something we you know we've seen before. Right. Um, that is already gonna take up uh, literal large parts, I would argue, you know, potentially up to a third of your brain is going to be in somehow involved in mm -hmm. trying to, to figure out what's going on Just there. in identifying the space, the object that, that's under scrutiny. What it is, what is where, it? where am I relative yeah. to this object? What might I want to do with it? What are my experiences with that mm -hmm. particular object in before the past? Even like, have I seen this this kind of coffee before? Right. Or I, or I know there's coffee inside this, right? I know that just by looking at it. Because the way you would grab it, if you if it, you just take a very the simplest yeah. thing you could do is just grab something. Yeah. The way you would grab it depends completely on what the object yeah. is. And that example is used very often. It is an example of something like a cup hot cup of coffee, let's say, right? Yes. You see the steam coming up from the coffee and uh, and you think all right, well, maybe I want, this one doesn't have a handle, but maybe I want to grab the handle instead of grabbing the side yeah. because the side's probably going to be hot. But you only know that yeah. because of context yes. that you've learned. So there's, a, there's, a, there's, you know, and now we're talking about involving the whole brain. Yeah. So we've barely, we haven't barely gotten anywhere. But it makes you realize yeah. how tied in motor is to everything else. Yeah. It's tied in with object representations, right? It, yeah. It, it has to be. We, bar we, we barely talked about what you, you know, what you actually have to do and yeah. you're already involving like your entire life experience, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, yeah, and, and it's of course it's it's essential to understand like you see a mug to understand what what does what does people do with a mug mm -hmm. to understand how you might want to interact with it, right. right? Whether you might want to grab it at all or how you might want to grab it. Yeah. Um, once yeah. I mean, once you've done that, okay, so we know. Let's say we know where it is in the space relative to us, mm -hmm. which is not a trivial thing to do. Yeah. Um, and we know what it is. 
um, then we have to also go off of our experience over time of how we know to interact with those objects, which of course depends on the context, right? So I know that that these things can be lifted by like putting my fingers around the side and applying some amount of pressure. Right. Um, again, learned over time and non-trivially. Um, so then, um, then you're engaging basically a plan, uh, so some specific you know representation um, over again large parts of, of large parts of motor cortex and mm-hmm. motor areas, um, which is somehow uh, preparing you to make that movement. Now that I that's a pretty like vague term. Yeah, um, but you've sort of prepped the space because you've identified the object. You have a representation of the thing that you're going to grasp or move to. So whatever movement happens is already tied specifically to that object in place, yes. right? Uh, which is fascinating, honestly. I mean, th- even if you think about the object as like a jar with a lid on it, and you're not just grasping, but as soon as you see a jar with a lid on it, you know exactly how to operate it. You yeah. know how that ob- that representation of that lid moving and coming off is a part of that object representation in your yeah. brain. And, and there's a good argument to be made um, that that process kind of happens automatically. I don't mm-hmm. know if automatically is the right word, but basically meaning that when you see the object, your brain is basically kind of going through the motions mm-hmm. and already already preparing you, making a plan to grab it. Yeah. Because that's something that you, given your experience, you might want to do. Sure. And so even though you haven't already, you know, let's say made a decision to, to do anything, already you kind of have a plan ready. Because you've got the thing representation sort of in in your attention, and that what comes along with that are the consequences of the usage of the yeah. thing, right? Uh, and, and to actually understand what the usages and consequences are, in some cases, you, you kind of have to simulate the doing of it. You have to think I, about it. You have to think about, yeah. or at least it, implicitly, it has to be done. It, it has to be considered, well, if I were to do this, mm-hmm. um, and, and that's, you know, at, at a much, much higher level, that goes into our, I mean, we're always sitting around playing scenarios through our, through our mind, you know, what yeah. am I going to be doing today, yeah. uh, conversation that I'm going to have. Um, mm-hmm. On a much lower level, it's probably also happening kind of automatically for movements in our environment, right. which, which help us to build that, yeah, that, that makes, higher level plan. That makes sense. You're um, not even aware of it. It's just... No, and it plays into, like, if we want to get in this direction, mm-hmm. but, you know, there's a whole mirror neuron community I'm doing this because it's a whole thing. Uh, if you've heard of that, I, I have not explain no. it. Um, but basically, um, by looking at individual neurons, uh, people have found that um, there are neurons that respond when you do an action and respond similarly when you observe the same action. Oh, right. Either Which... Visually or done by someone else. Yeah. Um, and that makes say it's sense. a whole thing because, you know, we can argue later about the, the the merits of describing you know individual neurons in that way, mm-hmm. um, but I think we can all agree that whether or not you know there's a special mirror neuron system, which I don't think there is, that's doing you know this one right. thing, it plays into what we were just talking about. That um, if I see you doing an action, right, how am I gonna? How do I know what the consequences of those actions are? Right? It might be important for me to know what you're doing in your environment. Sure. Uh, for me to understand that. Um, I think it makes sense that you have to somehow also play out this action yourself. Right. Say, right. if I was in your position and I was reaching for this, what would I be doing? What would I be doing? What would I do next? Yeah. Um, so in that sense, your own motor system, um, the actions that you can take on the world might help you understand the intentions of other people. Which totally makes sense, even from the standpoint of HTM theory, because we think of objects and object representations and we're starting to think of objects and behaviors of those objects also being coded in the same space. So for example, throwing a ball, you know, a human throwing a ball, that's a, a pattern, a sequence of patterns I think that anybody can bring up in their mind. They can think of yeah. a human throwing a ball. I can think of me throwing a ball, you throwing a ball, anybody throwing a ball. It's not necessarily tied to any specific human, no. uh, but, it's, but that whole sequence, that motor command, that action, everybody has a representation of that action, and they can apply it to whatever they think of applying it to. Yeah, right? and that when we think of throwing a ball, we're not just like watching a movie in our mind. Right, you're, those neurons are firing. We're also right? 
seeing something that might bear resemblance to when we actually do it. You can feel the sensation almost, yeah. you know, in your brain. You, you know what it feels like to throw a ball yeah. just by thinking about yeah. it. Yeah. It reminds me of something my dad always used to tell me was when we were practicing baseballs. Practice makes permanent, not perfect. He would always say exactly. that because, um, you know, because every time you repeat something, you're you're instilling in that neural pathway, you know, that sequence of, of motor commands that makes that yeah. perfect throw, you know. Um, you're honing it down. Uh, so let's yeah. let's go to the next topic. We we're just talking about um, reading the brain a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's go on to that. Uh, in order to try and understand what happens in the brain when a monkey grasps something or you throw a ball, you have to monitor the neurons. And there's a couple of different ways that uh, that uh, neuroscientists have done this. Maybe you could talk about a couple. Yeah. Of them. It's very difficult to record neurons in the brain, right? Yeah, I can of, imagine. Of, of a human, <laughs> of a monkey, of any of any animal, mm -hmm. um, because they're very, very small. Um, and so initial techniques involve, you know, sticking a piece of metal in there yeah. and just recording, you know, trying to keep it still long enough uh, to record from maybe one neuron. Yeah. Right. Uh, you Which know, is much more higher resolution than an electroencephalogram. Yeah, right. so I mean, we're talking at, at, at different levels here. Um, you know, if you have like an EEG on your scalp, you know, you're getting you're getting the summation of tens of thousands, hundreds yeah. of thousands of neurons, which happen to be oriented in a particular way that you can somehow pick that up yeah. outside the skull. It's not great info. Right? Um, it's info, but it's the the, temp, the spatial resolution is extremely low. Yes. Um, right. I mean, we're we're going almost as high resolution as you can get where you're sticking you know a piece of metal somewhere very very close to the body of an actual neuron mm -hmm. and measuring um, the action potentials of that and maybe a few other neurons in, in the vicinity right. um, which is really a completely completely different uh, scale the only way you can go farther than that is, is by actually having electrode directly on the, the membrane of the cell which sometimes people also do because uh, then you can measure the, the potentials inside the cell. Oh, uh, the actual voltage? Yes. Ah, yeah. Because, you know, outside the cell you see the, the, the spikes. Yes. But you don't see the fluctuations. You can see it going up and down. Um, and that's, that's, I mean, that's about as far as you can go so far, um, <laughs> like, you know, in a live thing. But, but sure. already just, just, you know, historically just recording from one cell um, is a big deal. And the techniques have improved over time, but quite quite slowly. So let me, let me just try and break this out into something tangible. So let's say you've got one neuron that you're monitoring out of however many you're monitoring, and you have uh, an animal in an experiment doing some behavior. So you could maybe map that one neuron to how fast the animal's moving and see if this, does this indicate give any indication of how fast the animal's moving, how fast that neuron's firing? Yes, for example, that could be. Um, that could be uh, one thing if you're, you know, in a uh, studying like motor related areas, mm -hmm. um, you might find some relationship between you know the speed of a movement and the firing rate of a neuron. Um, so it's not like you can so you can say okay there is some so there's some correlation between this neuron's firing rate and this particular attribute of a movement, but you still don't necessarily know what that neuron's representing or what it how what it's responding to in the environment. Is it part of the movement? Is it part of the sensory effect of grasping something you don't really know. It's just, you still have to guess, right? Yes. So there's, but there's, there's got to be better ways. Yes. <laughs> I've got another topic here on neuron, neuron populations. All right. So let's talk about that. Another yeah. way of monitoring brains during these experiments. So um, let's say we have our 200 neurons. Now we don't just have one neuron. We have 200 at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so. Traditionally, what would be done, right, relating uh, some of these, you know, like movement speed to the firing of an individual neuron, um, you could do this for a whole population of neurons, but if you actually have, uh, you know, a whole set of neurons recorded at the same time, what you actually see is that if you want to predict, let's say we talk in terms of prediction, if you want to predict um, what the firing rate of a neuron is going to be, uh, at a particular time or at the next time point, mm -hmm. actually the most informative thing is the state of the system. 
So there's a firing rate of all the other neurons. You have 200 neurons, you want to predict the state of neuron one at the next time point. Um, the most informative thing is just understanding, just looking at the firing rate of all the other neurons and drawing right. some relationship there. Not the external features. The external features you can draw relationships between, uh -huh. but actually the other neurons are most informative. Uh -huh. So it kind of brings the focus from, from the external world Back into to the, the internal the network system, to yeah. say, okay, well actually, um, behavior aside, yeah. uh, if I just had a big population of neurons, um, I can actually characterize that quite well just by just by understanding the relationship between the neurons. Yeah. Not between the neurons in the external space, but between the neurons themselves. So you're saying I've got neuron 147 in here in a big population, and I can tell without even knowing what's going on in the experiment that I'm likely to fire if these other guys around me are firing in a certain way. So yeah. You, so you can just tell that without even <laughs> Without even running yeah. the experiment, I guess. So. Yeah, it's a, it's just an attribute of the system itself. Correct, yeah. and uh, there's a lot of uh, you know avenues of research where that's just what people study is they try and get their hands on uh, you know recordings of many neurons at the same time mm -hmm. and try and extract from that can we understand the the connections or influences of the neuron system on each other, mm -hmm. um, not even considering what the specific uh, behavior is. Well, okay, so that brings us, I guess, to the, our last topic to talk about, which I think this is one of the more interesting topics. I, I labeled it strange attractors, but it's really about dynamical systems, because what you're talking about here with large pop, or larger populations of neurons and a different way of analyzing their activity is, is treating it like a dynamical system. Could you explain that a yeah. little bit? Um, so, you know, in physical systems, um, like, I don't know, planetary motion or just robotics or anything, um, you can describe those systems as um, a set of equations describing a system, how it evolves over time, mm -hmm. um, how its current state influences the next state, and so forth. You know, if it's a physical system, you might be looking at the velocity or the momentum um, mm. of, you know, planets moving around with respect to... Yeah, you know, I've seen in museums these pendulum things with like a pen on the bottom and you can see how it goes through these different two-dimensional states yeah. and it reaches this equilibrium sort of where it's drawing a certain pattern over and over and over. And uh, that's the attractor, I guess, idea behind dynamical systems, if I'm correct there. Yeah. So, I mean, all of these are dynamical systems in the sense that they... Uh, evolve over time based on the state of a, of a particular system mm -hmm. um, and so within a neuron itself people have used that analogy for a long time so a lot of people model neurons like individual neurons like the membrane of a neuron mm -hmm. as a dynamical system with yeah. different attractors. And a lot of people call the brain itself a dynamical system. Yes, and that's where, you know, that's where what I'm trying to focus on, but, you know, it's been in neuroscience for a long time, mm -hmm. um, of course, uh, and uh, people have characterized uh, individual neurons very well uh, in terms of, you know, how, how the action potentials occur, and then you go back to a particular baseline, mm -hmm. can all be described as a dynamical system within the cell itself. Mm -hmm. um, but you could also consider, as you just said, the whole brain or large populations of neurons as an interconnected dynamical system, which in a sense then has you know its own kind of velocity, its own momentum, yeah. its own uh, fixed dynamics over time. Well, uh, Dr. Michaels, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks a lot. And uh, thank you all for watching this interview with the neuroscientist. This has been Dr. Jonathan Michaels from uh, Stanford. And uh, if you like these series of videos, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel, HGM School. Take care, have a wonderful day.